Hi everyone and welcome, I'm Dave Nemeth. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's Talk of the Town. Today we have a panel of guests here to discuss the human papillomavirus vaccine, Gardasil. Now, human papillomavirus is also known as HPV, you've probably heard of it. It is the most common sexually transmitted infection worldwide. So people are wondering these days, do the risks associated with the Gardasil vaccine outweigh the potential benefits? Well, stick around, we're going to be discussing this controversial issue today. And first, we're going to take a look at some information about Gardasil and HPV. Initials that stands for the human papillomavirus. Um, it is a virus that um, is transmitted from um, human to human um, by close contact. There are about a hundred different varieties or a little over a hundred varieties, 30 to 40 which can infect the genital tract in men and women. HPV is spread really by skin to skin contact and so when you think about it that means that um, any kind of intimate um, contact has a potential of transmitting an HPV infection. HPV causes two types of diseases. One, we know external genital lesions or genital warts, and the other is cancer. And the interesting story with that is when we first started studying HPV, it was in the context of cervical cancer. And since 1995, when we made the statement that HPV causes cervical cancer, we now have definitive evidence that HPV causes cancer at the cervix, vulvar cancer, vaginal cancer, and anal cancer in women, as well as a small portion of oral cancers in women, as well as penile, anal, and oropharyngeal cancers in men. Gardasil is a, a vaccine. It's the only vaccine licensed in the, U in the United States to prevent infection with HPV. Um, it's made by Merck and Company, and it's a vaccine that's directed against four types of HPV. Two that cause cancer, HPV 16 and 18, and two that are responsible for 90% of genital warts, HPV 6 and 11. So all together, you get protection against cancer as well as genital warts. Okay, we're going to start by introducing our first studio guest today. Joining us right now is Dr. Douglas Holt of the University of South Florida, and you are also the director of the Hillsborough County Health Department. Dr. Holt, we saw some basic information there. Anything you'd like to add right off the top about Gardasil and about the HPV virus? Well, specifically about the virus itself, I think we pretty much covered that with a couple of comments, and that is that it's most common, sadly, among some of our least fortunate people, um, our minority population, uh, and those that uh, are, are um, poor. And that, of course, That's is where the issue of a vaccine comes in. Of course, vaccines are designed to prevent, but there's, there's also controversy regarding this vaccine because some people are saying, well, first of all, it doesn't necessarily uh, attack all types of strains, and, and second of all, there could be some negative side effects, some of them severe. Certainly. Any time a new, any new product or new drug comes on the market, people are going to have those questions. Um, it has certainly ha had a r rigorous amount of uh, testing and, and, and study, not uh, um, perhaps uh, long enough to be absolutely certain that it will prevent cancer. And I think that's where people sort of uh, challenge it. Well, what it does do is it prevents uh, uh, someone from getting infected with uh, forced strains of the hep, uh, human papillomavirus, particularly two that are associated with cancer, uh, and it will uh, reduce, at least in all those studied, uh, any detection of a precancerous lesion. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Dr. Holt's going to join us again a little bit later on. Right now, though, we want to go ahead and toss it to another uh, roll-in, if you will, from somebody else who has a lot to say, uh, State Representative Ed Homan, who is also a doctor. This happens to be the safest vaccine that we have. Other vaccines are made from either live or dead viruses. You then inject small amounts of a live virus and your body then makes antibodies to the virus. It's the antibodies that you have that you carry for many, many years and sometimes your lifetime that if you get an infected organism that comes into your body, then it's your antibodies that defeat the infection and do not allow it to replicate. Dead viruses work the same way in that you develop antibodies to it. This particular vaccine is made in a laboratory, not from a virus. It's made from VLP called virus-like particles. They're combinations of chemicals that your body perceives to be the virus, but it's not. And so the reactions that people get 
to other vaccines can't happen with this particular vaccine since it's not made from a virus. Certain people in the House, and they happen to be in positions that could control the fate of a bill, who saw this as a uh, ethical religious vaccine, that it wasn't about cancer, that it was about sex. And that was, it's never about sex. It's about preventing deaths. It's about preventing expense, about preventing grief. And my entire session was trying to separate the issues of sex from the issues of health. This was a health bill, not a sex bill. Okay, State Representative Ed Homan. And now before we continue this discussion, Dr. Douglas Holt is still with us and also we'd like to introduce the rest of our panel. Uh, we have Sabrina Burton Schultz. She's the Director of Life Ministries at the Diocese of St. Petersburg. Also joining us uh, to my right, Tampa pediatrician Dr. Tommy Burrell and Immunizations Program Manager directly to my right, Margaret Ewan from the Hillsborough County uh, Health Department. So let's let's talk about this. And, and uh, interesting what, what Representative Homan said about uh, so many people are worried about this being a sexual issue, and, a, and, a, and, and it's really not a sexual issue. But when we talk about uh, mandating somebody to take any kind of an immunization, uh, that, that, that it, hands go up and s mm. people start getting a, a, a little bit, a bit panicky. Sabrina, why don't we why don't we start with your your thoughts on that? Well, what we oppose is not the vaccine itself. There. Are proven benefits to the vaccine. What we oppose is the mandatory nature of the vaccine or any proposed legislation that would make it mandatory, particularly for young girls. Parents should have the right to, to control that. Now, in the proposed legislation, or the legislation that was proposed last year, there was an opt-out clause for parents. But we don't believe parents should have to go through the trouble of opting out. That places the burden on them. They should be able to opt in if they desire that vaccine for their child. They make that decision as parents. Um, they shouldn't have to explain to government officials why they don't want this vaccine for their daughter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Margaret, why don't you answer to that? Do you have any, any thoughts on the well, mandating I, of the vaccine? I, I do agree. Um, I don't think it should be mandated. I think it should be a parent's right to uh, want this for their daughters. I think the, the, the best thing is to educate people what this vaccine is all about and how it can prevent the cervical cancer. Uh, when you do that, you get more people wanting to do something for their daughters. And I think that's the way we should go rather than, say, mandating it. Okay. Dr. Burrell, how about yourself? Uh, I agree. It's, it's not one of the highly contagious things like, you know, tuberculosis years ago, measles, chickenpox, which really affects them in a large number. This is an individual. And, you know, we're in a country where we do have to have it. We, Going too far on mandates, I think, is against us. But the education and all is where it has to start. And it is a, as it gets out there and we show how effective it is, I think a lot of this will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Now, I have two college-age uh, daughters myself, and, and, and it seems to only be focusing on women and the development of, of potential cervical cancer down the road for these young women. Uh, is there any regard to, to, uh, to considering vaccinating young men, boys, Dr. Holt? Yeah, yeah Dave, um, well, just to follow up on the mandatory question, I mean, generally public health, we look at uh, why would we do that? What's the benefit to the society? Uh, the first is, as Dr. Burrell has expressed, is, is generally pretty clear and understood from everybody. If, if, if there's gonna be a likelihood of transmitting a serious infection from one person to another in a setting such as a school or a work. It doesn't or have to be a sexual situation. Oh no, no. It's most of our contact. Most of ours. Well, this this particular virus uh, is uh, skin to skin contact, um, and um, it's a it's a pretty close intimate contact. Mm -hmm. um, but my my point was that in those situations, you want to reduce the chance of that transmission happening in the setting. Well. If we're going to do that and for this to, to work, if for, to achieve that, we would need to vaccinate both boys and girls. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it really is not designed to achieve that purpose. The purpose of this, and there are other vaccines that society has chosen, and that is it almost becomes more of a personal health issue. Mm -hmm. Is it best to be vaccinated about something that will reduce the chance of you getting an illness that costs a lot of resources and injuries and all things. 
Hepatitis B is a good example of that, uh, hepatitis A and some others, um, gradually became apparent that, that we should stop, um, uh, reduce the chance of people getting cirrhosis and hepatoma, cancers mm -hmm. of the liver. Well, um, I'm going to stop you here so we can go to our next <laughs> clip. It's a very controversial issue, obviously. So for more insight on the controversy surrounding the Gardasil vaccine for the human papillomavirus, we're going to get a chance tonight now to listen to an interview that was done on the phone with Jane Acri. Uh, she is from the injury, she's from InjuryBoard.com, so listen to her. It's uh, recommended for people as young as nine, for girls as young as nine, although it was never tested on girls that young. And as the ad adverse reports are coming in to the FDA, and only a portion of them actually are ever reported, but as they come in, there's some serious side effects. Judicial Watch was successful in gathering about 2,000 adverse reports. And they include everything from uh, paralysis, uh, blood clots, fainting, deaths, a whole range of things. Um, you know, there are about, about 20 deaths so far by judi that Judicial Watch has uncovered, and this is, you know, only about 10% are adverse reports are, are reportedly given to the FDA. Um, let's see, in June, Judicial Watch had obtained 3,461 adverse reports. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, Margaret Ewan, what would you have to say about uh, Jane Akery's comments there? Well, the more common side effects uh, from this vaccine is a slight um, soreness at the injection site, redness, maybe some swelling. Um, sometimes people may get a, a slight fever. Um, now, 20 deaths is what she said. Do we, uh, do we have substantiation not as, those on Those are that? not real common and there's no real um, link that they can really say that it definitely was from the vaccine. It, the more common reactions that you get are slight soreness or uh, fainting, sometimes from young girls that may yeah, faint I at think the vaccine. Just to be clear, there has, those are not causations. Those deaths are not due to the vaccine. Okay. Those are reports that people, if anyone who's been vaccinated, what happened to them for whatever reason Okay. Put into Do this. you think as a whole, and anybody can answer this, that, that just we tend to overblow potential side effects, we, we, we tend to blow the horn louder than we need to, or do you think it's, it's necessary to point out each and every possibility? Because it does get escalated. Well, uh, I'll take it to like, we have to do studies, and I've done a few studies from vaccines to medications, and the FDA requires you to report everything. That's not bad. But there's one antibiotic that was uh, that has a broken arm as a possible side effect because it was reported during the investigation period. Hmm. So it can be overblown. Everything is going to have some side effects. This is one of them more painful, but it's tolerable uh, shot for what it's producing. And the deaths, none of them. They've gone to birth death certificates and investigate them and that none of them has been associated with it. The paralysis, there has been no cause and effect between the two, and now we, most of us separate it from the meningitis shot to make sure there's no association. Well, now back to the mandating. Uh, Sabrina, you and I were talking a little earlier about uh, immigrants now coming into this country. There's a big controversy brewing there about should they be vaccinated, and, and, and I guess uh, you, you had something to say about that. Well, for immigrants, for young women between, I believe, the ages of 16 and, and 20 something, there is no opt out clause. They must be vaccinated. But they're not even required to receive the full regime of vaccines. They receive the first vaccine before they can be cleared for their immigration status. And there are three. There are three that Gardasil recommends mm -hmm. in order to you know, promote yeah, antibodies. There's absolutely no medical reason, no rationale for that policy. No. I don't know how that could be. It's yet justified. another unjust immigration policy. You know, yet another hoop for them to jump through, and at great expense. No okay. benefit to, to our society, to no. us. Well, I don't see how there could not benefit to some degree. I mean, if if the, if the disease is spread through contact and the virus is is therefore coming into the country, isn't it isn't it indeed best to make sure that that there's anybody in the country, whether they're immigrant or resident, six million infections with this every year. 
Um, I don't. I can't even imagine the numbers of the of the um, immigrants we're talking about, and you're giving them one dose out of three. Mm. Okay. No. All right. Well, let me ask you this again for somebody who has two daughters. Uh, neither one of mine have been vaccinated. One of them. Uh, was told that she uh, perhaps had the virus and then it, it, it apparently goes dormant after a while. It can go dormant and then come back later in life. Uh, is that somebody who should be vaccinated or is that somebody who should, is at a risk to be vaccinated? Anybody? Oh, um, the question about the dormancy is that most of these infections actually are silent for a long duration of time. It's only a subgroup that actually created the warts or the precancerous lesions. And over time, whether it's silent or whether it's manifesting it, the majority of them will leave the body, will, will be eliminated by your immune system. Okay. A very small percentage of those will stay precancerous and a small percentage of those will develop cancer. I certainly would recommend anyone, my daughter, we, we made our decision for our, with our daughter at 14, anyone from 9 to 26, um, if you have not had that, if you know you have not had that specific type, there are four types, mm -hmm. I would be vaccinated. I okay. would recommend it. Okay. I'm not we're going to we're take a look at another clip here first. This is uh, Loveline sex and relationship expert, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Now, you may have also know him uh, from VH1 Celebrity Rehab. See what he has to say. Gardasil is a vaccine that has an unusually benign safety profile. The only concerns I've ever seen is when it's being administered with meningococcal uh, vaccine simultaneously, and since they've stopped doing that, I've not seen any reports of any meaningful reaction. Uh, certainly, any time you pull out a needle, somebody might faint, and certainly uh, the power of placebo is overwhelming, particularly in this country, and people can report all kinds of things. But this is a vaccine that will save tens of thousands of lives, has been used on millions of people, and has an unusually benign safety profile. I would urge anyone who has fear of this particular vaccine especially to please just look at the data. Just look for yourself. It has a very benign safety profile. I had my daughter vaccinated immediately as soon as the vaccine came out. There was no waiting for it. And if there were evidence, and you would need evidence to show that somehow vaccinating a young woman against this particular STI would somehow encourage sexual behavior, then I would reconsider this. But there's zero evidence of that. And the, the idea is anathema to the truth. So please, we've vaccinated our kids at one against hepatitis B. That's an STI. I, I don't believe for a second that, that even putting a child, a young woman on birth control uh, at a certain age is, is going to promote promiscuity. It's simply going to keep that child safe. And so I think really in, in, in the same respect, uh, it, it seems like a logical thing to do. Uh, Dave, I compare it to, uh, you tell your children, that they have to buckle up their seatbelt. That does not condone speeding mm -hmm. or reckless driving. Mm -hmm. It's for their safety. And uh, getting to one point we passed over to is I also am waiting for the, to get approved in males and in boys because they are the carrier, just like many of the other things, and that will also help. Are there, are there tests to show effectiveness in, in, in males? I haven't seen them. I'm studies sure studies. Are they're, they're, they're ongoing studies. They're ongoing studies. And it may have been to also production right. and the availability of it. In mm -hmm. fact, I think a USF researcher is involved in those studies down in uh, actually South America, I think in some populations in the United States. Okay, Sabrina, uh, how do you feel about that and as far as do you think it encourages uh, promiscuous behavior or I don't see this vaccine increasing promiscuity. I guess my only caution would be that perhaps it could um, lower their fear level a little bit in engaging in sexual activity. And there are still a variety of other reasons to maintain good pre precautions. Lower the number of sexual partners before, before marriage, um, or eliminate the number of sexual partners before marriage. You know, this vaccine does not prevent against HIV. It doesn't prevent against other STDs that could be deadly or lead to infertility. Um, and I would just worry about a false sense of security that it may offer, particularly to the younger girls who may not have the understanding that some of the young adults would. And mm -hmm. also, this can be passed even if they use a condom yes. and protection. It, the, war, the, the virus usually gets around it when they've done the studies. Right. So there is no safe way to protect against 
Yeah. This. No. Okay. Well, that, that's that's yeah. really important, and I think all parents need to understand that it's obviously abstinence is going to to solve a lot of issues, but not all children, particularly teenagers, who you know haven't developed fully uh, the mental capacity to not take risks and to not okay. say no, uh, they get themselves in trouble, whether we like to admit it or not, and you, whether we think it's our child or not, it, it probably is. Yeah. If, if we could figure out a, I mean, uh, a way to. Um, uh, uh, to reduce people or kids from um, taking risk or, or not being uh, 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 afraid of doing something. I, it just uh, doesn't seem to enter into their thought process a lot now, so I don't think this would add anything to that. Okay, very but good. That being We're said, <laughs> absence-only programs are having good effects, mm -hmm. um, not only in private schools but in public schools. So, you know, I would not discount those programs. I think they're having very positive effects in at least helping teens to maintain abstinence through high school or perhaps through college. You know, and any time we can extend that and lower the number of sexual partners, we lower their, their incidence of HPV and other, effects, and other diseases. Okay, let's take a look at another clip we have from David Hastings. Uh, he would like to share his thoughts about HPV and uh, Gardasil. I'm a cancer survivor and, and my cancer was caused by HPV and it was caused in the oral cavity. So if there is a vaccine that can prevent someone having to go through the treatment I did, I'm all for it. Educate yourself. Don't just listen to, to what other people say. Go online. Read about HPV. Read about the Gardasil vaccination. Don't just sit there and say, I don't want my, my daughter or my son, hopefully, uh, to get it because they're going to have sex. And, you know, I don't want them to have sex. That's, that's, that's ludicrous. They're going to have sex. And I would hope that you would hope that they would have sex. Otherwise, how are they going to reproduce? How's the world going to live? I mean, how did you get here? You know, were you the uh, other immaculate conception? I mean, I don't know. Well, again, everybody has their, their thoughts and their opinions and different ideas. And I think the, the important thing is, is that, like this show here today, we're, we're talking about it. We're throwing out there what, what options are there. We're, we're weighing out potential risks. Uh, anything, Dr. Burrell, you'd like to, like to say here? No, I think it's, uh, you know, here we have something for the first time to truly prevent cancer. And, you know, it's a very emotional thing for women to get cancer of any type uh, with their reproductive organs. And now we can at least reduce it, the number, and in the years to come, uh, it's, we're going to see a, you know, great effect from this. Margaret, you and you, you had the immunizations program. Uh, what would you like to say, just to well, kind of sum up your feelings in the video? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a pro proponent for uh, vaccines. Um, prevention is always a good thing. Uh, and when you have something that can prevent an illness, I think that's the way to go. Um, it is, so far, all the tests that have shown it's a very good vaccine. And I, I would recommend that, you know, people just get educated about it and not listen to you know, our research, uh, the wrong sites, and really get the facts about this vaccine. Um, so education is, is my whole thing. It's really getting educated and getting the facts. And I think we'll have more people wanting to um, take that vaccine, want their daughters to get that vaccine. And hopefully in the near future, we'll have it for the boys as well. Sabrina, why don't we let you follow up on that? What would you like to see happen as far as uh, research and, and statistics and information being put out there regarding the, the Gardasil vaccine? And, and how would you suggest that be done in a, in a proper manner? Uh, well, again, I would just oppose any mandates on any population, and I'd like to see it be the parent's choice of how and when to, to provide their children with that information, their sons and daughters. You know, anytime we take that control away from the parents, I think we've done the family a disservice. Okay. Dr. Holt? Well, again, I think 4,000 women each year die of cervical cancer in the United States, approximately. 400, um, 400 of those in Florida, about 40 in Hillsborough County. Uh, if this vaccine uh, even lives up to a partial of its promise, um, we could save 20 lives a year here in Hillsborough County. Um, that may not be enough to mandate it mm -hmm. because they look at the cost, but if it's one of my kids, I want it to be one of those survivors. Well, that's, the, and Sabrina, and you, you make the point, it, it is up to parents, but how many parents are out there really weighing it properly and how many people are, uh, again, th as a parent, you tend to want to go, 
not my kid. You know, my kid's not going to be out there. But but the more I knew and the more I learned about just sexual activity among among children. Mm -hmm. Once my girls were teenagers, they went on on birth control, and it was not something they asked for, and it was not something that everybody was 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 really thrilled to hear. But we felt it's it's not giving them permission. It's simply giving them protection. There are people worried about the you know, company and non merc There's women health websites they can Google and get away from if they're worried about the manufacturers that are good sites that give you the good information and the statistics and they can get the research uh, by just okay. Googling it and not have to depend on us or the manufacturer. But many of the blogs can say anything they want without any evidence. Go get right. a legitimate site and get legitimate information. Educate, educate, educate. Thank you all very much. We're going to run out of time here, and that is all the time we have. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Douglas Holt here, Sabrina Burton-Schultz, Dr. Tommy Burrell, and Margaret Ewan for all of your help and your input, and we appreciate you taking time to, to be here today on Talk of the Town. Thank you very much, and I thank you. I'm Dave Nemeth, and we appreciate you watching the show today. And uh, again, just get educated.